A Russian rocket attack on Ukraine's Independence Day may have been even more deadly than first reported. Russia's defense ministry claims missiles killed more than 200 Ukrainian troops on a transport train. Ukrainian officials say at least 25 people, including civilians, were killed and dozens more injured by Russian shells in Chaplina. The attack came six months to the day after Russia invaded its neighbor. This is what Ukrainians had feared for days. A Russian attack on civilian infrastructure on the six-month anniversary of its invasion. The small town of Chapolina in eastern Ukraine was shelled twice. This man found his son's body after the blast. He was in the house. He was thrown out of there. We looked for him and he was lying here. Nobody knew that he was here. There was no sound. Nothing at all was heard. Just an explosion, a blast, and then the fire started. Authorities say several people were burnt in a car. As the UN Security Council met to mark six months of the Ukraine war, President Zelensky addressed the session to tell the world about the latest Russian attack, despite Moscow's attempt to block his appearance. The rescuers are working. But, unfortunately, the death toll could increase. That is how Russia prepared for this session. But with the deaths rising every day, there appears little hope for the war to end anytime soon. DW correspondent Roman Goncharenko joins me now uh, from Kiev. Um, Roman, we'll talk about this missile strike on Chaplina in just a moment. But first, we are hearing that safety systems have been activated at the Zaporizhia nuclear plant in Ukraine. Uh, what more can you tell us? Well, at this stage, it is still very unclear what is really happening. We had uh, um, reports from Ukrainian authorities uh, saying that in the city of Energodar, where that uh, nuclear power plant is situated, there is no electricity and no water, and the Ukrainian side blamed the Russians for it. The city is under Russian control, and there also should be a fire in a forest somewhere nearby. We also have report from Rus reports from the Russian side uh, claiming that uh, in uh, certain regions under Russian control, uh, in the regions of Kherson and Zaporizhia, there is no uh, electricity and no water, and the Russian side is blaming the Ukrainians for it. The Russian side is also claiming that there was a, um, a kind of alarm uh, at the station itself, but it's, it was mended somehow. The Ukrainian side is waiting for an official reaction by the Ukrainian uh, Nuclear Energy Agency, but there hasn't been any statement so far, so the situation remains very unclear. Mm. We'll, of course, uh, stay on top of that story for the rest of the day. But now getting back to that missile strike uh, on uh, the town of Chaplina, that was the worst of several strikes, wasn't it? Yes, there were several strikes, and uh, the Russian side is now claiming, the Russian defense ministry, that uh, by that strike, the biggest, the deadliest strike on the day of independence, uh, there were not just uh, 25 casualties, uh, civilian casualties, but also some 200 Ukrainian soldiers could have been uh, hit. This is uh, the, what the Russian defense ministry says. Uh, the Ukrainian side uh, um, has not uh, um, spoken to that, and uh, I, I would wonder if that would be the case, because uh, Ukrainian defense ministry, Ukrainian government, is withholding information about its casualties. Theoretically, it is possible that there were some soldiers on that train, but we cannot verify that information. Uh, in Ukraine, in general, there were eight rocket strikes that day, according to Ukrainian officials, and the death toll as you've just mentioned, is about 25 persons. This is at least the count as of now. DW is Roman Goncharenko. They're reporting from Kyiv. Many thanks, Roman. Now, the war in Ukraine has also served as a wake-up call across Europe regarding the threat posed by Russia. It's given the NATO military alliance, that's 30 countries, including the US and most of Europe, as well as Turkey, a new sense of purpose.
something many felt had been lacking in NATO in recent years. Within just a few months of the invasion, Finland and Sweden also announced their intentions to seek NATO membership after decades of neutrality. The addition of Finland is especially relevant. It means that NATO will have a much larger border with Russia, and as the alliance has started upgrading its rapid response force in Europe from about 40,000 before the war to over 300,000. It's also bulked up its forces in uh, countries at Europe's eastern border, from Romania and Bulgaria in the south to Latvia and Lithuania up there in the north. And for more, we can now cross to Brussels, where NATO is headquartered. And as it happens, Terry Schulz, our correspondent there, is uh, standing by. Terry, um, at the start of that uh, war, we saw NATO more united than ever. Is that still the case? That's right, Gerhardt. In, in many ways, as, as horrible as it sounds to say, this conflict between Russia and Ukraine has galvanized NATO in a way we've never seen before. As you mentioned, it has beefed up its defenses along the eastern border. For the first time ever, it activated its rapid response force, and countries have pledged hundreds of thousands more troops to that force, as well as resources to have at the ready. NATO has completely reconfigured itself so that it could move much more quickly should Russia Russia dare to step into NATO territory. And exactly as Russia did not want, NATO has now determined that it will keep many of these resources and troops in these places long term, perhaps even permanently, to defend against whatever Russia may have in store now that Moscow has turned out to be so unpredictable and so brutal. Now, the head of NATO, Jens Stoltenberg, told Ukraine it could rely on NATO uh, NATO support for, quote, as long as it takes. But how long can member states realistically keep up public support in their own countries? This is a big question, and of course, it's being watched in every capital, but uh, very closely in Kyiv as well, with Ukrainian officials warning, uh, warning daily that uh, Europe cannot experience fatigue, that the United States must keep up its support. And in fact, that is more difficult to say as gas prices rise, as citizens start looking at where the money is going and wondering if, if military support for Ukraine is in their interest. And in fact, there was some concern in July as as European governments did not make any new military commitments of equipment to Ukraine. But we have seen in August those uh, contributions step up again. We've just seen the United States pledge another $3 billion worth of military equipment to Ukraine. Germany has just finalized a, a package of some $500 million worth of equipment. And we're also seeing countries step up with more training for Ukraine to use these new weapons. So, in fact, it seems that on the military side, uh, the support is being maintained for now. But again, as long as it takes, is much easier for NATO Secretary General Stoltenberg to say because he doesn't have a government budget to control. Our correspondent, Terry Schultz, there at NATO headquarters in Brussels. Thanks a lot, Terry.